And so we come to A Century of Poetry. Anthony Thwaite continues his exploration of the 19th century by looking at some of the poetry of the 1860s. I ended the last program in this series with a new voice from America, that of Walt Whitman, using what he himself called his barbaric yawp. In England, a similarly controversial, but otherwise totally dissimilar poet, was about to emerge. Swinburne had been born in Victoria's coronation year, 1837. In 1865, still in his twenties, and after a few publications which had attracted little attention, he brought out Atalanta in Caledon. In the following year, Poems and Ballads. Both were immediately a huge success, particularly with the university young. Swinburne's poems were seductively, mesmerizingly rhythmical. They were full of not very submerged sex, including sadism and masochism, words not yet invented, incidentally. They had an unchristian hedonism very different from Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat, even a defiant blasphemy. Thou hast conquered, O pale Galilean, the world has grown grey from thy breath. Oxford undergraduates with linked arms would stride down the high, chanting his verses. Such verses as these, the chorus from Atalanta in Caledon. When the hounds of spring are on winter's traces, the mother of months in meadow or plain fills the shadows and windy places with lisp of leaves and ripple of rain. And the brown bright nightingale, amorous, is half assuaged for Italus, for the Thracian ships and the foreign faces, the tongueless vigil and all the pain. Come, with bows bent and with emptying of quivers, maiden most perfect, lady of light, with a noise of winds and many rivers, with a clamor of waters and with might, bind on thy sandals, O thou most fleet, over the splendor and speed of thy feet. For the faint east quickens, the one west shivers round the feet of the day and the feet of the night. Where shall we find her? How shall we sing to her, fold our hands round her knees and cling? Oh, that man's heart were as fire and could spring to her, fire or the strength of the streams that spring. For the stars and the winds are unto her as raiment, as songs of the harp player. For the risen stars and the fallen cling to her, and the southwest wind and the west wind sing. For winter's rains and ruins are over, and all the season of snows and sins, the days dividing lover and lover, the light that loses, the night that wins, and time remembered is grief forgotten, and frosts are slain, and flowers begotten, and in green underwood and cover, blossom by blossom, the spring begins. The full streams feed on flower of rushes, ripe grasses trammel a travelling foot. The faint fresh flame of the young year flushes from leaf to flower and flower to fruit. And fruit and leaf are as gold and fire, and the oat is heard above the lyre, and the hoofed heel of a satyr crushes the chestnut husk at the chestnut root. And Pan by noon, and Bacchus by night, fleeter of foot than the fleet-foot kid, follows with dancing and fills with delight the menad and the basarid. And soft as lips that laugh and hide, the laughing leaves of the trees divide, and screen from seeing and leave in sight the god pursuing the maiden hid. The ivy falls with the bacchanal's hair over her eyebrows, hiding her eyes. The wild vine slipping down leaves bare her bright breast, shortening into size. The wild vine slips with the weight of its leaves, but the buried ivy catches and cleaves to the limbs that glitter, the feet that scare, the wolf that follows, the form that flies. Heady stuff. And Swinburne, and writers and artists who began to be associated with him, were soon to be labelled, sternly disapproved of in articles with such headings as Immorality in Authorship and The Fleshly School of Poetry. Among these was Dante Gabriel Rossetti, whose private life and public behaviour might have attracted such disapproval, but whose poems are much more decorous. What he seems best at is brief moments of mystery, as in The Wood Spurge, or Sudden Light, poems which were collected in book form in 1870, but which made their first appearance before that. Here is Sudden Light. 
I have been here before. But when or how, I cannot tell. I know the grass beyond the door, the sweet, keen smell, the sighing sound, the lights around the shore. You have been mine before. How long ago, I may not know. But just when, at that swallow saw, your neck turned so, some veil did fall. I knew it all of yore. Has this been thus before? And shall not thus time's eddying flight still with our lives our love restore in death's despite? And day and night yield one delight once more? Rossetti's younger sister, Christina, was never called fleshly by anyone, and rightly. Her very successful Goblin Market and other poems, which appeared in 1862, showed, among other things, a plangent melancholy and a most delicate and skilful technique, as in Remember. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land, when you can no more hold me by the hand, nor I half turn to go, yet turning stay. Remember me when no more day by day you tell me of our future that you planned. Only remember me. You understand it will be late to cancel then or pray. Yet if you should forget me for a while and afterwards remember, do not grieve. For if the darkness and corruption leave a vestige of the thoughts that once I had, better by far you should forget and smile than that you should remember and be sad. We don't know much, nor need we, about Christina Rossetti's actual love longings and soul searchings. It's very different with George Meredith. His eight years of unhappy marriage to Peacock's daughter, Mary Ellen, have been exhaustively documented and in resonant, fictitious form in the sequence of sixteen-line poems, ever since called Meredithian Sonnets, Modern Love, published in 1862. No one much nowadays reads Meredith's novels, I think, though he was once far better known as a novelist. Modern Love survives, perhaps more strongly now than ever. Here is number 34 of the 50 poems. Madam would speak with me. So... Now it comes, the deluge or else fire. She's well, she thanks my husbandship. Our chain on silence clanks. Time leers between, above his twiddling thumbs. Am I quite well? Most excellent in health. The journals, too, I diligently peruse. Vesuvius is expected to give news. Niagara is no noisier. By stealth, our eyes dart scrutinizing snakes. She's dad, I'm happy, says her quivering underlip. And are not you? How can I be? Take ship, for happiness is somewhere to be had. Nowhere for me. Her voice is barely heard. I am not melted and make no pretense. With commonplace I freeze her, tongue and sense. Niagara or Vesuvius is deferred. Love, human love, is in a sense the starting point of Matthew Arnold's finest poem, Dover Beach. But it ranges beyond that to become a meditation on faith, on purpose, one could even absurdly say, on the meaning of life. Yet he does all this quite briefly, in only 37 lines, and with a figurativeness that never allows it to become dully abstract. To me, this is not only the central Arnold poem, but even the central Victorian poem. It may have been written as early as 1851. It wasn't published until 1867. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. 
The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window. Sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray, where the sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. Begin and cease and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once, too, at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long-withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges and drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another. For the world, which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. I ended the first program in this series with a poem by Blake that's become so well known as a hymn that one can hardly read the words without singing them. Much the same is true of the next poem. In 1861, the American Civil War broke out, and in the following year, Julia Ward Howe published her Battle Hymn of the Republic. The tune to which it became attached marks a slightly earlier stage in the war between the states and the anti-slavery struggle. John Brown's body. Here are the words of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. If you're contemptuous or snooty and don't think they make a true poem, well, they stand serenely in Richard Ellman's New Oxford Book of American Verse between Henry Thoreau and James Russell Lowell. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fatal lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. I have read a fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. As ye deal with my contemners, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero, born of woman, crush the serpent with his heel, since God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. The year after the conclusion of the American Civil War, Herman Melville, already the author of that prose epic, Moby Dick, published a book of poems called Battle Pieces. In it is a poem that commemorates the Battle of Shiloh, 14, 1862, when Grant's forces were routed by the Confederates. If Julia Ward Howe's strident hymn is one face of that war, Melville's Shiloh, a requiem, is another, equally valid. Skimming lightly, wheeling still, the swallows fly low over the field in clouded days, the forest field of Shiloh. Over the field where April rain solaced the parched ones stretched in pain through the pause of night that followed the Sunday fight 
around the church of Shiloh. The church so lone, the log-built one, that echoed to many a parting groan and natural prayer of dying foemen mingled there. Foemen at morn, but friends at eve, fame or country least their care, what like a bullet can undeceive? But now they lie low, while over them the swallows skim, and all is hushed at Shiloh. Now, still staying in America, as for the last two poems, I'm going to break quite flagrantly the rule I've tried to impose throughout this series of presenting poems as they were published rather than when they were written. With a handful, literally five, exceptions, all of them mangled by editors and printers, Emily Dickinson's poems didn't begin to be published until 1890, four years after her death. But the ten years of this program, 1860 to 1869, were her most productive. The estimate for 1862 is 366 poems. For 1863, 140. For 1864, 172, and so on. They lay in a box in Amherst, Massachusetts. The full texts weren't published until 1955. From Emily Dickinson's vast production, almost 1,800 poems, is this chilling, amazing example, probably written in 1863. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove. He knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure, too, for his civility. We passed the school, where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun, or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown my tippet only tulle. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. Back to England for the end, and to those who are already famous. Browning's Confessions is another of his inventions or dramatic monologues, but partly stylistically, partly because it seems, maybe only seems, to speak in a voice that might really be Browning's and not an adopted one, it strikes a different note. What is he buzzing in my ears? Now that I come to die... Do I view the world as a veil of tears? Ah, reverend sir, not I. What I viewed there once, what I view again, where the physic bottles stand on the table's edge, is a suburb lane with a wall to my bedside hand. That lane sloped, much as the bottles do, from a house you could descry o'er the garden wall. Is the curtain blue or green to a healthy eye? To mine, it serves for the old June weather, blue above lane and wall. And that farthest bottle labelled ether is the house or topping all. At a terrace, somewhere near the stopper, there watched for me one June, a girl. I know, sir, it's improper, my poor mind's out of tune. Only there was a way. You crept close by the side to dodge eyes in the house. Two eyes except. They styled their house the lodge. What right had a lounger up their lane? But by creeping very close with the good wall's help, their eyes might strain and stretch themselves to o's, yet never catch her and me together as she left the attic, there by the rim of the bottle, labelled ether, and stole from stair to stair, 
and stood by the rose-wreathed gate. Alas, we loved, sir, used to meet. How sad and bad and mad it was. But then, how it was sweet. Finally, the grandest voice of the decade, indeed of the period. In his Idylls of the King, Tennyson wrote an epic cycle based on the legends of King Arthur. We heard in the last programme Mrs. Browning's objections in Aurora Lee to this sort of thing, if not precisely to this thing itself. But I'd agree with Tennyson when he said he could hardly light upon a finer close than that ghost-like passing away of the king. The last lines of the passing of Arthur were the dying king's answer to Bedivere, the last of his knights. And slowly answered Arthur from the barge, the old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. Comfort thyself, what comfort is in me. I have lived my life, and that which I have done may he within himself make pure. But thou, if thou should never see my face again, Pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me, night and day. For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain, if, knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer both for themselves and those who call them friend? For so the whole round earth is every way bound by gold chains about the feet of God. But now, farewell. I am going a long way with these thou seest. If indeed I go, for all my mind is clouded with a doubt. To the island valley of Avilion, where falls not hail or rain or any snow, nor ever wind blows loudly, but it lies deep meadowed, happy, fair with orchard lawns and bowery hollows crowned with summer sea, where I will heal me of my grievous wound. So said he, and the barge with oar and sail moved from the brink like some full-breasted swan that fluting a wild carol ere her death ruffles her pure cold plume and takes the flood with swarthy webs. Long stood Sir Bedivere, revolving many memories, till the hull looked one black dot against the verge of dawn, and on the mere the wailing died away. But when that moan had passed for evermore, the stillness of the dead world's winter dawn amazed him, and he groaned, The king is gone. And therewithal came on him the weird rhyme, From the great deep to the great deep he goes. Whereat he slowly turned and slowly clomb the last hard footstep of that iron crag, then smarked the black howl moving yet, and cried, He passes to be king among the dead, and after healing of his grievous wound he comes again. But if he come no more, O oh me, be yon dark queens in yon black boat who shrieked and wailed, the three whereat we gazed on that high day, when clothed with living light, they stood before his throne in silence, friends of Arthur, who should help him at his need. Then from the dawn it seemed there came, but faint as from beyond the limit of the world, like the last echo born of a great cry, sounds as if some fair city were one voice around a king returning from his wars. Thereat, once more he moved about, and clomb even to the highest he could climb, and saw, 
straining his eyes beneath an arch of hand, or thought he saw the speck that bare the king down that long water opening on the deep somewhere far off, pass on and on, and go from less to less, and vanish into light. And the new sun rose, bringing the new year.